want to welcome Rick Fisher with us. And we have had the good fortune of partnering with the Thoughtful Classroom and having uh, Rick Fisher with us to do some professional learning and some opportunities for us. And so we asked and invited him to be part of our new teacher cadre. And so he's really focusing on instruction and resources, and they have tons and tons of tools and resources. And each time that he joins us, he shares a little of those tools and resources, and, and we're glad to have those. So I'm gonna turn that over to Rick. Thank you, Dion. I really appreciate that. Good afternoon. Uh, as Dion said, we're the Thoughtful Classroom. For me, I was a classroom teacher uh, and a principal and assistant superintendent, all of that. Uh, I said in three seconds, uh, it took me over 30 years to live through. And, and, uh, but the one thing that's always been a constant for me is teaching and learning. That's a great passion for me and in, in my life. And, and to have a chance to continue it uh, beyond my uh, public school service days uh, has really been a blessing to me and my family. And so um, um, Thoughtful Classroom, been around, hey, check this out. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of the formation of the Thoughtful Classroom. I mean, I think it's the longest lasting educational training organization outside of a university or something uh, in the world. And so the longevity, 50 years means we've been able to uh, uh, weather all the storms of teaching and learning uh, uh, changes that go on. And uh, that's really because we are really about uh, how. Uh, there's a lot of research out there. I have volumes of books on my in my bookcases here in my home, and and as I'm sure you do on your shelves in your school and home, and they all tell you about what we ought to be doing. And so we can be very familiar with the research about what we're supposed to be doing. The Thoughtful Classroom focuses on, okay, so I'm a teacher. How? How do I put these things into practice in a way that's, uh, easy to use, uh, simple in design, and most importantly, actually give me a result that I'm looking for. And the thing about thoughtful classroom tools and strategies is they've been vetted. They're uh, unlike teacher pay teachers or other kinds of things where you can't be sure if these are valid and reliable um, strategies. And some are, them some certainly are, uh, some are not. And uh, but but you can rest assured that thoughtful classroom tools and strategies have been vetted by thousands of teachers over, uh, over many, many years, and they've been proven to work um, almost every time. So um, I'm really happy to excited, really, to share these things. I love them. I've used them for 20 years in my own career, and, uh, our schools and, and district. And I know they work and I'm excited to share with you some more today. And so this is your first time. Hey, here we go. And if it's you're back again, thanks for coming back. And we're going to add to your tool belt today. Our focus today is going to be on um, building positive relationships. And, and one of the things that we know for sure in education is that a successful classroom really has to stay, like all things, have to have a foundation. And without a solid foundation, uh, everything that's built on top of that is going to not be very sound. And this is true in a classroom. And we collected uh, thousands of uh, data from teachers across the United States. And, and then we took all those things and we said, you know, what, is, what makes a successful classroom and, and all that data? And we distilled that down into what we would really call four cornerstones. And the four cornerstones are organization rules and procedures, building positive relationships, having engagement and enjoyment. School should be fun. Learning should be fun. And fourth is a culture, a culture for thinking and a culture for learning. And these are the what we call the cornerstones of an effective classroom. And um, um, research also really clear on this fact. If you don't have these four cornerstones soundly in place in a classroom, no matter what else you do, it all gets compromised. Deep learning cannot happen without a solid foundation to support it. And so, so, so we work a lot with uh, new teachers, experienced teachers, veteran teachers on these cornerstones 
because when I go from school to school in just the three years I've been uh, retired, whatever that means, from the public school system and out working with Thoughtful Classroom, I ask teachers, what do you want more of? And the list is almost always identical from preschool to high school, doesn't matter which grade level or district. Um, the things are always from this element, these, these cornerstones. And so it proves that they're so valuable to us. And so we're going to focus today uh, particularly on this cornerstone of positive relationships and how to build positive relationships. You might be familiar with Daniel Goldman. Um, he's been an expert in emotional intelligence. The old EQ is more important than IQ in so many ways in, in terms of success in life. And uh, if we had more time, I would tell you some great stories about uh, the research on that. But uh, Goldman says this is definitely an important part of teaching, is that emotional intelligence is more important for success in school and life than uh, the IQ. So that's why in the Thoughtful Classroom, we support the idea of using a technique that we call check your mood at the door. Simple to use, easy to implement, and pretty effective. I want to begin today with um, this tool and a little bit of how it works with you. So pick a feeling word. I put some on the board here. And... Um, Think about a feeling word. It might be one on the board. It might be a, another word that comes to your mind, right? So uh, thinking about where your mood is right now. So find a word in your mind and, and then add a because. It's a simple, uh, that's another tool, right? A because tool. Um, for example, I, I'll give my example, then we'll collect one or two from you all. You know, it's a brand new year and we're thinking about all the New Year's resolutions and what we often think about is our aspirations. And um, I know that uh, the, uh, you know, as part of our health system in Kentucky is you have the, uh, you can gain the points and stuff through the health and wellness uh, piece. And and um, and so my wife and I have signed up for those and we're, we're using those goals, working on those goals. And you pick two goals, you work on them. And the one I've chosen this year is um, is uh, is to think more about each day, or at least in this whatever this period of time, I guess on for a couple of weeks, I guess. I'm focusing on being grateful. And so today I'm feeling very grateful. And I'm grateful because I had a chance to be a teacher. And I think teaching is a calling. And we arrive at it. Some some of us come right out of school, go right into college, and we know that's what we want to be. And others of us arrive at teaching uh, from other avenues. And uh, it doesn't matter. Um, the calling all finds us. And I'm grateful to have had the chance to work with kids. And, and today I teach just in a different way, working with adults. So I'm grateful for being a teacher because it's given me so much uh, joy and happiness to work with and help people learn. So uh, would love to hear one or two of you share your feeling word and your because. And you can put it in the chat. Yeah, um, we have uh, proud, the proud of their team, excited because of new opportunities, um, excited um, from a coaching perspective because they have a new um, weightlifting program. Um, excited there's um, and blessed so yeah I've, I've clicked on those I see that Nathan uh, uh, weight lifting season is on and I really like the way you you had your word and you had your because and so several of you there putting things in chat thank you thank you so much so check your mood at the door it's a great way simple easy every day to have kids come in and just get a chance to say Here's my mood today, because the mood is going to affect learning. And so we want to be really 
noticing what's happening with that. And so you can hang a poster at the entrance of your classroom like this one. You can actually even purchase these from the Thoughtful Classroom. And you can have kids just come in each day and they can stick their post-it note on wherever they think they are. Um, you can have them high five those things and really kind of make that sort of a, a, a beginning uh, of the class. I've seen other teachers use uh, clothes pins, different kinds of things uh, to in order for kids to show here's kind of where my mood is today. And, and you know, you, you it gives you a chance to know, OK, I know Rick's uh, kind of not doing good today. I might want to pat him on the back or check in and say, hey, man, I noticed you weren't doing good today. What's happening? So. Um, it's a, just a simple way, but a great way and a, a powerful way to let kids express, here's what's going on. I know school is important, and certainly it's important to us as teachers, but we have to also think about what's going on in the minds of kids and how can we support them. And this is a really simple and quick way to do it, and it's an effective way for them to share. Uh, we've collected a lot of teachers uh, over the years so who, who have uh, created these for different uh, genres of teaching, right? Here was an art teacher's version of check your mood at the door. Uh, here was a phys, phys ed teacher. And uh, they put this on the door of the gym. And as kids come in each day, they, uh, you know, pick uh, uh, how they want to, how they're feeling today. So there's a lot of different ways you can do that. But again, it gives the kids outlets to say, hey, man, I'm having a great day today. And I wish somebody would ask me about it. Or I'm having a terrible day today. And I, I wish somebody would ask me about it. So check your mood at the door. That one's so simple. Um, you can make it happen tomorrow. So one of the things that we also want to do in terms of relationships is, is really getting to know kids. And I want to share this next tool with you. Uh, it's just one of my favorites, uh, and I've seen it work with so many people. You know, one of the, this is a challenge for us. You've got a lot of kids. And, uh, you know, when I was teaching, I had 180 kids during the day as a middle school uh, science teacher. And so it's hard to get to know them all uh, quickly, right? And so this is this is certainly a thing. And we want to build this relationship because it really matters a lot. Take a look at this statement. Not a powerful statement. Um, relationships are a precursor to learning. Well, wow. it's almost like love and marriage. You can't have one without the other, as the old song goes for the sitcom. So what makes for a great, great classroom? Think about that for a second. What makes for a great classroom? What would you say? Think about that in your own mind. Did you say it feels like a community? In your mind, did you think about it being a place that's safe? Is it a place where kids are seen and that kids know they count, they matter? Is it a place where we show respect and we give respect? And it's a place we come to learn. So I'm sure you had many of those running through your mind as you thought about what makes for a great classroom. And when you think about the classrooms, uh, the years, uh, if you're an elementary school teacher uh, and periods, if you're a um, upper elementary, middle high school teacher, you have those periods or you have those years where you have, man, that's just the perfect chemistry of kids. That was a, that was a great classroom. And, and, um, yeah, I think uh, you come up with some of those words and we've all had those others too when they weren't such a great spots because we had issues. Dr. James Comer says no significant learning can occur without a significant relationship. And so let's talk about this idea of relationships. Certainly there's there's several relationships going on, right? We know the one between student and teacher and that's an important one. Building a relationship with kids matters. You know, I learned, as a middle school teacher, I learned this very early on because we had sixth, seventh, eighth grade in our school. I taught a little sixth grade, but majority of seventh and eighth grade. And uh, I would always make sure that I uh, listened in with the sixth grade teachers to find out whose names they were talking about because 
whoever was the most trouble were definitely going to be in my classroom as a seventh and eighth grader. It's just the way it was. And, and so I spent a lot of time getting to know those kids during their sixth grade year when I would catch them in the gym or if I had duty outside or in the hallways between classes or whatever, that I could catch these kids and just have a conversation. I was building a relationship with them because I knew someday they're going to be in my class because they're causing trouble in the school and they're going to be with me at some point. And, um, and so I wanted to have uh, a, a good relationship before problems arise. And boy, that's the best advice I can give new teachers is really, really make sure you get to know kids, make sure they're seen and they, and they know you care because as Dr. Nancy Minix, my, my teacher in college, uh, as a middle grade education teacher, she taught all the classes and she told us every day, every day. And it was, it was our bell. It, it was, you know, you don't have a bell ringing, but we couldn't leave the class until she told us, remember, kids don't want to know how much you know till they know how much you care. And then we were dismissed. And that happened every day for every class I ever had with Dr. Minix. And she ingrained that in me. I, I thought she actually invented the saying, but that's not true. That's like George Maxwell or somebody. But anyway, so you have a relationship with the teacher and the kid. The other relationship out there is, of course, student to student. So student to student relationships are important. But there's, there's another relationship. The relationship between the content you teach and the students. And we have to build a relationship between those two things because they're often their form, right? The things that kids are coming to your class to learn, they're not necessarily, they're not things that they know. And so you're building a relationship, an interest, a connection to the things that you're trying to teach. And of course, to the world, how does the world around us work? And we're trying to build these relationships. Uh, this is really multidimensional, not just student to teacher. And so I want to uh, make sure we think about it in that way. And I'll try to bring some other tools in today that sort of touch on um, multiples of these things. And the first tool here is called getting to know you. It's a collection. So if you look at this tool in the in this particular tool book, it's in the bottom of the screen. It's a collection of techniques. And, and I'm only going to share um, a couple with you out of that section. But uh, and one in particular is absolutely my favorite. And we call it the hand of knowledge. Man, this is so good. It, it, it's, it's a tool that's one, it's very versatile. It's a tool that I can use for multiple uh, problems. And I want to share the first one with you. So one of the first things you can use it is to really help kids celebrate and share cultural traditions. Now, it doesn't have to be kids from a different country, right? It can be kids from a different state or a different county, a different part of the state. It's that we have we come and we have different cultural traditions. And, and so you can use the tool, the hand of knowledge as a way to celebrate and share cultural traditions. Let me show you what I mean. So here's a young girl named Tamika. She was born in Louisiana and she moved here to Kentucky. And this is her, this is her um, hand of knowledge. And so she's talking about nationality, culture, ethnicity, ethnicity, celebrations, foods that she likes, and, and what, what do we value? My family and I, we value some things. Everybody has values. And, and so, so the kids take the hand of knowledge and they jot some things down and then they write a kind of a get to know you or they put together a list of things and, and they're, gonna, they're ready to share that. Well, here's another student, and this is Marcus. And a Mark, a Marcus has lived in Kentucky his whole life. And so Marcus thinks about his hands and the values and the foods and the celebrations that his family does. And, and so he, he comes up with a, a list of things and jots some things down. You can write these things if you have older kids, um, more list of things if you got younger kids. And, and then you get some kids together, right? So let's share our hands of knowledge and let's look for commonalities and differences and then talk about the things they learned about a classmate that they didn't know before. And this is a great little exercise to do um, at the beginning of the year, beginning of the semester. And so when these two kids got together, 
they found out, wow, we come from, I come from Louisiana, you come from Kentucky, and yet we both, we have very common things that we do like and believe, right? Certainly we have some differences, but we have more things alike than difference. And, and I got to tell you, uh, I work with a lot of new teachers through uh, the university and, and, uh, um, and I had a teacher before Thanksgiving who said, I got two kids, man, they are fighting, fussing. I can't, I can't teach for them. They're just doing stuff all the time. And can you help me with that? And I said, well, I got an idea. And so I shared this tool with the teacher and she said, I, I like that idea. I'm going to give it a try. And so between there and just before Christmas break, when we had a little check-in meeting, she told me, she said, wow, I can't believe how good that's actually worked. They're getting along so much better. They're not fighting as much. It's really, really made a big difference. And I, I think it's going to continue to improve. So really just having kids sit down who have differences and realize, hey, wait a minute, we're more alike than we're different. And that's a great way to use this tool, Hand of Knowledge. It can help you solve some conflicts that you might have between kids, um, between groups of kids sometimes in your school. So that's one way to use the tool. The other way to use the tool for a teacher is really to, to learn about the learning preferences, talents, and aspirations of kids. And this is where you really get to know kids. And, and what a great tool for teachers. If you got 25 kids in the class, or you're like me, you had 180. This is a way to collect some information that you can use throughout the course of the year, both to build relationship with you and the student and with your student and the content. Let's see how this goes. So you have the hand of knowledge and then, and then the tool. Um, and any of these tools, if, if you have an interest in them, you can let us know and uh, uh, we, can, we can share some things with you. So you get a hand of knowledge and you ask the kid to think about six things, okay? Six things on the hand. So on the pinky finger, you ask, what do you do for fun in your free time? And then this kid said, making up dance routines. On the ring finger, what is something you're really good at? This kid chose soccer. Now in the middle school, high school, maybe even elementary school these days, I don't know. You have to be careful about the middle finger. But in the middle finger is think about something interesting you learned outside of school. What is it and how'd you learn it? So what are you noticing about these first three questions? Yeah, they have nothing to do with school. They have everything to do with the person, right? The student. What do you like to do for fun? What are you really good at? And they might say, I'm great at algebra. Okay. But they could choose. I'm great piano pianist. Um, I, I'm a great you know, dog trainer, it doesn't matter, right? It's whatever they're good at. And then think about something that's interesting you learned out of school. How'd you learn that? See, that's metacognitive. Uh, how, did I, how did I learn how to do that, right? How did I learn how to play soccer? It's great metacognition. So let's look at the other points. Index finger, what word or phrase best characterizes you as a learner? Hmm. On the thumb, when school is hard for you, what makes it difficult? Man, this is great information for a teacher and gives you great insights on what's going on in a kid's mind, what they believe about their, their abilities and themselves as a learner in your class, in your subject, or whatever. And, and, and then the last one, the palm, it's really my favorite, right? What's your dream? What do you dream about? What do you want to be? Dreams are powerful and really helping kids tap into what do I dream about? That's motivation, right? It may be, we may have a different dream tomorrow or next year or next week, but a dream is a powerful thing. And, and it gives us a, a reason to move forward, to do the things we want to be. And it gives you a chance to tie in content to the things they're dreaming about. And I think that's just a powerful thing. And the other thing I would say about the hand of knowledge is, so once you do this, you do it at the beginning of the year, you could do this this week um, in your own classroom and use it for the rest of the year because you gather information that you can help build a relationship with your kid, 
with your content and your student and between your students. The hand of knowledge, ladies and gentlemen, the hand of knowledge. That's a great little tool. Here's another version of that, and I'm going to quickly jump through this one. But if you like this kind of thing, um, and I use the hand with adults, so the hand's not a thing. I was just uh, two days ago, I was in a school district uh, on site training, and we used the hand of knowledge, and every teacher was filling out their hand. So it works no matter you know, what, um, what level, as long as they can write. And, but here's another version, if you like the format a little bit differently, there's a, a series of best foot forward uh, questions like, I learn best when my greatest strength is the subject that I do best in, and here's why, that's a because. And here's, I do my best work when the assignments are what? And so again, you get a lot of good information about what a student thinks about in their what do they what what moves them what motivates them what inspires them to, to 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 work in your class today just to wrap up this idea of the getting to know you uh tools in the hand of knowledge uh teachers who use this here's some of those outcomes right so teachers tell us they see once they use this thing they see greater empathy and trust among kids that the classroom becomes more of a community and that engagement actually goes up because again we're connecting relationships of the content to the kid and there's more openness a sharing of personal and cultural experiences it's like hey it's okay it's a safe space for me to be me this is a powerful uh, tool set of tools uh, collection we use that word of tools to help you think about um, building relationships. So let me pause. We should always pause and and reflect for just a minute and think about what's what's uh, clear, what's cloudy, what's connecting, what's questions you might have, comments you might want to make. So I'll pause for 30 seconds and see if there's anything that you want to ask about or comment on. All right, uh, two down, two to go in terms of our tool sets today. This next set of tools uh, really focus on interaction, right? How do we um, use interaction? How do we use relationships to help kids learn? And so this is a set of um, moves that you can make um, in your uh, classrooms. I know some of you have probably some resource type classrooms and others of you have uh, both resource and you're out in collaborative classrooms. And these tools work in any of these zones. In fact, if you're in a collaborative classroom, you can share these tools with your uh, cooperating teacher and maybe do them with your whole class. I mean, nothing wrong with that. Uh, they'll work with all groups, all students, all grade levels. Another great thing about the tools. So let's think about some interaction tools. So, you know, we ask ourselves sometimes, we, we, we go from school to school across the uh, nation and, and, and we see a lot of classrooms that still seem to operate uh, like this. And we ask ourselves, why is, why is that instead of this? Why are we not having more time for kids to interact and share information. Two heads are better than one and uh, that kind of thing. And the research um, out there, a lot of media sources as well, talking about student voice makes a difference. Student voice matters. And here's the thing, you can write this one down, right? This is a powerful thing. When I first learned this and it first internalized this in my own mind some years ago, it really profoundly changes the way you think about teaching. Whoever is doing the talking is doing the learning. Whoever is doing the talking is doing the learning. And we think about it um, as teachers, we're doing a lot of learning and the kids are doing a lot of sitting and getting and they're not getting it. And so they don't learn it. And so whoever's doing the talking is doing the learning. So we want to flip-flop this. We want to get the kids to do some talking. And how do we change that voice in the classroom? 
Well, here's a, another set of tools um, in what we call interaction in an instant. And in this um, particular tool set, I'm going to share four techniques. A think pair share, like what we call a give one, get one, a physical barometer, and clock partners. Four interaction tools, simple to use, easy to implement. Here we go. Our first one, think, pair, share. How many of you have heard of think, pair, share? Somebody might even have used think, pair, share. Well, this is a great tool because one, it, it, it does some important things. One, it allows each kid to do their own thinking, right? Everybody needs to do their own thinking first. And then they can share their idea, their thought with a partner and, and really refine their ideas. Or if they're just, oh gosh, I wasn't really sure about that, but I get, I get what you're saying. I understand that better now. Now I'm able to then share with a larger class. And see, this is very powerful because a lot of kids, kids like me, I was a shy kid in school. Nobody believes that uh, because I, I'm out doing this stuff all the time. Uh, but I was a very shy kid in school, and I did not want to raise my hand and offer up any answer, as with a lot of other kids, right? Because you don't want to risk uh, embarrassment. And so think, pair, share is a powerful way to make sure every kid is on the same level, right? They get a chance to talk with a partner, and then they're prepared to talk to the class because I hey, bounced some ideas off. I got a great idea from 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 this person, and they they they're, they're I'm going to use that. And so think, pair, share is a great tool. Uh, for building interaction and it kind of works like this and sometimes we like to think about a you know, it, it certainly think pair share think in your mind and then talk with your neighbor but you can add another layer uh, to this and say it's a think right pair share and i really like this concept because you know when you're writing things down it's just another layer of remembering it right and so you you, you know you kids are write down a thing and then they go uh, with a partner and they share. Here's what I wrote down. Here's what you wrote down. And I can adjust mine. You can, you can adjust yours, whatever we have going on. And then we're prepared then to share with everyone. And so it's a really, sometimes we call that warm calling, right? Because uh, you get a chance to try your answer out, think about it a little bit before you share it with a larger group. So it's safe. Think, pair, share can be used in many times across a classroom lesson, a period of time. You can use it before, before the lesson begins. It's to sort of to activate prior knowledge with things like this. What do you know about fractions? Think about that for a minute. Talk with your partner about that for a minute. Now, let's share with the whole group. There's another one. What do you predict will happen in this experiment? So you can use think, pair, share before. You can also get out in the middle of class and say, wow, I need to build some understanding here. I need to deepen the understanding for my students. And so you can pause and do a think, pair, share anywhere out in the middle of the lesson. And certainly you can use it as a reflection, as an application. And, you know, here's a math teacher, which one of these problems are solved incorrectly. Think about it. Talk it over with your partner. Okay, now I'm going to call on some people or I'm going to ask some people to share. So it's a powerful tool and it's versatile. You can use it with confidence at any time during the lesson. Think individually, share with a partner, share with the group. The next one, give one, get one. Wow, I love, I love, I love this tool on so many levels. And we often partner this with um, another um, a tool of ours, but I'll just share, give one, get one at the moment, okay? So this technique really 
helps the free flow of ideas. Um, it allows me to think about what I'm thinking about, but also to collect what everybody else is thinking about or several other people are thinking about. And so I'm really churning up the content. I'm churning up the knowledge of things that I need to know and remember in the class. And so it really encourages divergent thinking. And here's like, you know, it starts out with a, you know, a question, right? It could be any question about your content, like why are plants important to us in our world? What makes for a true friend? How many ways can you represent a half? And what are some ways to get better at your study habits? And so you just pose a question, right? And, and so you give the student a time to think about that. So, you know, what makes a true friend? The well, student jots down, you know, three answers here. Then I take my list and I go and find another partner. And I like to do this up and around the room because, again, it's a good chance to move kids around a little bit and, um, and burn off some of that energy. You can also do table partners, but that's sometimes a little boring. Uh, moving them around some is good because you get different thinking in different parts of the room. So I, I take my list and I go to find a partner and I say, you know, here's an idea that I have on my list. And the other person says, great, here's one idea you didn't have that I have and I'll share with you. And so I'm going to give you an idea. I'm going to get an idea. So my list just now went from three items to four items. And you can cycle that through three, four times if you want however much you want to. And I just keep adding to my list. And so I'm, oh yeah, I didn't think about that. Oh, that was a good idea. So you see how I was sharing all of the ideas and you're, and, and, and this is very, this is very, um, you know, uh, easy access because there's not one right answer. There's not one way to think about this. And I'm going to have a chance to collect other people's ideas. And so um, powerful in so many ways. A couple of rules about that, right? No huddling. You only use pairs. Don't share multiple ideas. It's give one, get one. And if the responses are identical, come up with a new one. And then you just do that. Like we said, as many times as you want to do it, two or three or four more times. Uh, one of the tips we have is to really start slow with this. You might do the 90 second rule, right? Go find five people, give and get one, five people and you have a minute and a half. So you can do this pretty quickly, but you're really expanding and reviewing the knowledge that kids are uh, coming up with, right? The third in this collection of interaction techniques is what we call a physical barometer. I was uh, training uh, uh, in a school district back in the summer. And I, I had the audience, you, we do these, and when we're on site, a lot of times we'll act these things out. And I had them do a physical barometer. And uh, a, a couple of weeks later, the uh, teacher from that training emailed me and says, I didn't, I, what was that thing called? And can tell me how to use it again. And so I sent her the tool and we talked about it a little bit. And, and uh, I saw her again a little bit later on. And she said, well, I'm using that thing. I love it. So physical barometer is another one of those tools that's uh, pretty popular with teachers. And it really has kids take a position, right, on a multi-sided issue. And then they're able to discuss and refine their positions with like-minded classmates and then attempt to win over students who took a different position. So this is fun. This is engaging, right? We can, we can have a good debate about things. Here's how it works. So you start with a multi-sided question or a statement, you know? Where do you stand on the issue of using animals for scientific research? Which of the tall tales that we read would be the best one for teaching younger students the attributes of a tall tale? You know, what is your position on the use of social media in the classroom? It doesn't matter, right? It's going to be a, there's, there's your own, this side or that side. That's the, that's the critical thing. And you can use this for any content, right? You just got to think about how would this, how could I use this to have a um, multi-sided problem? And then you just say, okay, so, we have the categories, and I usually uh, will take a piece of um, 
you know, a, a Xerox paper and a copy paper and, and put a sign up. And then if you're a classroom teacher, you can use that sign over and over again when you get ready to do it. Um, and you got to strongly agree, somewhat agree, disagree, strongly disagree. I don't know. I'm kind of in the middle. And then you say, okay, so here's the thing. So go where you think you feel like is the right thing for you. And so everybody goes into their respective corners or some are not really sure. And so they're kind of in the middle and you give kids a chance to talk, talk that over, right? Talk about it a little bit, you know, why do we strongly agree or why do we strongly disagree? And they're talking about it within their like groups. So as they're having a conversation and then they, uh, share that out, right? Here's some, some reasons why our position is the best position. Here's why, here's our because. because We disagree with this because, and here's our because. And then you give people a chance to go, did we persuade anybody to change their mind? And, you know, some kids can go, oh, okay, especially the people in neutral, right? They weren't sure. Now they've gotten some people's opinions. Oh, I think I, I, think I agree with what you say. And so it gives me a chance to move. So a uh, really neat little tool. Uh, a lot of thinking happens there, right? You got to justify things. You got to defend the position, stake a claim, and provide evidence for it. I mean, it's that simple thing that's required in all of our content areas today, but it's a fun and engaging way to think about that. The physical barometer. And the fourth tool is one you've most likely seen before. It's really a, uh, the clock partners tool. You know, it's a way to, again, mix up your class, right? Get kids talking to different kids. And that's the underlying theme of all this. It helps build community. And, and sometimes, sometimes can be very helpful in, oh, everybody in this room actually can contribute. Because, you know, I didn't think Rick knew anything. You know, he, you know, he, he don't know anything. But when I, I had to go see him today on that one of those interaction in the instant things or uh, give one, get one, he, he, he had one or two to share. And, and uh, wow, that was pretty good. And so it gives a chance to build that community, all these things we were talking about before. And so clock partners, uh, very simple. I mean, you, you, you list the name of a person on each hour of your clock. And that doesn't mean hours you're just going to say as a teacher then right you want to say okay um pose a question or give a task or whatever that is and say okay go find your eight o'clock partner today we're using the eight o'clock partner so i, I miguel is my eight o'clock partner so i'm gonna go find miguel in class and we're gonna we're gonna talk and share and then tomorrow i might use the or, or i might use multiple times during a particular class but again it's a way to to get kids to do that. And kids have to sign up. They go and see each other and say, okay, you're my two o'clock partner. I'm looking for a six o'clock. I need a six o'clock. Isaiah says, oh, I need a six o'clock partner too. And you know, or, you know, if you're elementary, and you want to assign them totally good there too. You might want to do that. So you have, you have the option, but a clock partner is a great way to mix and mingle your students to help build community, share ideas and learn from each other. And you want to make sure the kids are clear about their roles and be an eavesdropper. You always want to be listening in, walking through, even on give one, get one, right? You're not sitting back over at your desk watching it. You're out, you're out mingling and you're listening to what kids are saying. You're collecting information as a teacher uh, to help you move the class forward. So, um, and, and make sure students understand their role. You know, your job is to, is to give one and get one. Your idea is to share ideas. Here's how that works. You have to model those things for kids. You know, sometimes we assume kids know how to talk and have a conversation, and it's not true. They don't. So we end up fighting it, right? I t you all are not talking about the things I told you to talk about. See, those are things you have to create, and um, we call that procedural pro. It's another tool, and uh, you, you have to teach it, rehearse it, practice it, and then turn it over to kids to own that. And they are expected to do it. And you're walking and listening and talking and making sure that it does happen. And, and in time, you build those habits and it really changes um, the way things happen in the class. Teachers who use this set of tools tell us these things.
I'll pause here also for questions, comments, or snide remarks. Uh, Rick, this is Doug. Uh, just, a, I guess, a comment. Uh, I think these are, are great as far as building uh, content knowledge and uh, showing what students know, but I also think it would help with that building a, that classroom community that uh, togetherness that, you know, I can talk to anyone in the, in the class and I can share my ideas and they share their ideas and we work together to make us a better community and a better environment for everyone in the classroom. So I, I, I love these strategies. Uh, like I said, the hand one was awesome. That's, that's really cool because like you said, it's all about the student. It's not anything about school or anything like that. And I think for like a, a first day, a first couple of day activity or uh, back to class after a extended break activity, those would be great too. Or when you get a new student into the class, so, you know, sometimes we have students move in during the school year and may not know anyone. And I think that'd be a great, uh, relationship building uh, activity for those students so well that's a great thank you Doug that's a great point too right you a new kid comes in to class which happens to us right all the time during the course of a year and you say hey here's your hand of knowledge I want you to fill this out and then uh, give you you know we'll share this with with some students and it's a great way to 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 help a kid feel like oh you know I'm, I'm valued here uh, they're interested in me and who I am and it's great information for the teacher as well but also to your point about you're really building a community and all of these techniques build community while also helping kids learn content in a really safe, non-threatening way. And oftentimes, you know, we talk about for, for all kids and for kids of, uh, with learning disabilities, often confidence is a big issue, right? I'm not confident in, in, in this whole school business thing. These techniques help me build confidence and help a student build confidence in themselves. And when the teacher said, you know, I'm not very good at math. I'm not very good at math. I'm not comfortable in math. But, you know, when the teacher says, hey, Rick, I, I hear you're really good at basketball and you really love that. Well, you, you give me some confidence that this is a safe place and I'm going to get better at math because you're interested in me. And that really builds that whole community. And uh, Maddie, Maddie also said building student engagement with learning and building it uh, socially. We build it together, right? Yeah, it's, it's building that community. Well, thank you all very much. We got one to go here, one tool to go, and I think we're right on track for time. So let's take a look at this last tool. This last tool is gonna resolve, uh, be about resolving conflicts. Does anybody have any conflicts <laughs> in your class? And some of you are like, got both hands raised right now, if I could see you all. Um, because we, yes, we have conflicts in our classrooms, no matter what grade level we happen to teach or in what situation. And so this set, this tool um, is, a, is a powerful tool, I think, in self-regulation. And that's a life skill. And so I'm, I'm excited to share it with you. When we, when, it, when we think about conflict in classroom, who's usually responsible for solving the conflicts? Well, of course, you, the teacher, you're in charge of resolving the conflict. But what if we changed who is responsible? What if we turned this around and said, wait a minute, you are responsible for resolving your conflicts. Man, would that change the way things happen for us in school, right? Would it empower kids, teach them, but it also would take a big load off of us and trying to always be the judge and jury of the conflicts. Not, that's not going to solve every conflict, but if we could reduce the number of conflicts and empower kids to solve their own problems, man, that, that would be a huge step forward for us in, in school and in, in society for that matter. The research about this idea is getting very clear is that we kids need to learn how to manage their own conflict resolve conflicts with themselves because in life you're going to always have conflict and and there's not always going to be somebody who can mediate for you or decide uh, who's the judge and who's guilty and who's innocent so you have to you have to learn these skills and we have to teach them in school they don't they don't come 
anymore with these kinds of things. I think maybe in times past, perhaps we were better at this, but um, not so much today. So this tool is called Say S to Resolving Conflicts. And this is an empowerment tool. As I've used that word several times. It's an empowerment tool. Um, it gives kids some things, some strategies, right? Some moves, some actions they can take that really stresses being calm, collecting your thoughts, listening, and coming up with a resolution. Well, all those sounds... That sounds really almost like too good to be true, right? It's like a pie in the sky kind of idea. But watch this thing. When I say, say S to resolving conflicts. We call it say S because all of the moves start with the letter S. And so let me walk you through this. And you, you can teach these tools to students, right? You have to teach these tools. That's another whole session, right? We could talk about how do you teach a tool to students? But, but you have to show them how. Model it for them, do it for them. So it starts out with, you know, state what happened. Share consequences, feelings, motivations. See the incident from the other person's perspective. Stop and discuss. Show you were listening. Strategize together, select a fix-it strategy, and sign your name. Let's break these down a little bit. State what happened. So here's a kid who said, you know, Travis grabbed a ball out of my hands after I called him a play and took it and called me a bad name. Share the consequences. How did the incident affect you? How did it make you feel? How did you behave and react? Why did you react the way you did? And so the kid has a chance to say, well, I didn't like being called a name. And it, 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 you know, I didn't like him knocking the ball out of my hand. I really wanted to hit him. But I didn't do it, though, because I knew I, I shouldn't. So here's the thing, right? Okay, so look at it from the other perspective. Why would Travis have done that? And this is what the kid came up with. You know, right or wrong, it's what the kid came up with. Okay, let me think about this from a different perspective. Why would Travis do what he did to me? And this is what the kid thought. So just to recap, right? What happened? Here's what happened. Now, what are the consequences? What are the feelings? What are the motivations? Here's, here's why I'm angry about it. Let me look at it from the other person's perspective. Why would they do that? Next step, stop and discuss. Show you were listening and strategize together. And, and this is powerful right here, right? So you're having a chance to talk about it. Stay cool. Summarizing what each other said. Here's, what, here's why I did what I did. I'm sorry I did it. I shouldn't have done that. I'm having a bad day, blah, blah, blah. Whatever the reasons, right? Okay, so you, you say you're having a bad day. I get that. But, you know, it was still rude what you did. So how are we going to solve this problem? How are we going to do this? How are we going to prevent this from happening again? How are we going to not have this to carry on? you know, on to tomorrow or this afternoon. And so, you know, they strategize a little bit. So what are we going to do? And see, this is why you really have to teach this to kids. These are the steps, right? So we're going to stop, discuss, we're going to listen, and we're going to show that we're listening. We didn't blow off what you said. I value what you say. I mean, I agree with it. I don't have to agree with it. I just have to value it and listen at it. And then we got to come up with a plan. How do we solve this problem? And then we, we select a strategy, right? So we agree. So in this case, the kid said, hey, we agree to work better together for the benefit of the team and make sure that everyone on the team has an opportunity to participate in the game play. And then they sign their name. 
And so you have the form here, and that's uh, kind of how they work on solving their problems. You, you can or cannot use the form, but it, it gives you a way to, to really think about this. But then you have this idea of, okay, this is what we committed to, and this is what we're going to try to do. So we have a plan and a strategy. We're going to use that strategy and see how it goes. Students don't come to school with a school gene. They have to be taught certain skills, certain ways of dealing with other people. So we want to make sure that we have these skills internalized. So this isn't a set of worksheets that we complete together and we're done. It's a set of behaviors that we practice and they become part of what we are. Bob? So just a few tips on this tool, okay? Tips for kids. When you have a problem, stay calm. Stop, breathe. Think about this for a minute. Pause, right? When things happen, stay calm, keep cool, stop and breathe, stop and breathe before you react, right? Another tip, but this is a great tip here on teaching kids. When you've got a problem, don't get into all the emotional pieces of it, right? So, you know, when you act like a big bully and you pushed me, no, 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 no. When you pushed me, here's what happened. You see, it take some of that emotion away from it. It helps to deflate things. I, I've seen this before, before where kids start talking to you. Your teacher got two kids out in the hallway and they're trying to talk about it. And it's like, you, 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 and they're pointing fingers and stuff. And now I'm just, you're just making me mad. We're just not solving the problem. And, and so taking some of that emotion out of it and just, here's the facts. The facts are you push me. And, and when you push me, this is what happened, right? You made me fall down and look like an idiot in front of everyone. Instead of that, you say just the facts. I fell down in front of the whole class and I was embarrassed by that. And that's a, you see how the big shift in that, right? That feels like I'm not attacking you. This is what you did to me and this is how it made me feel. That changes the way I feel about things. When you get back just to the facts and take away the a you, 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 it's just your fault, you bad person. Another tip is try using the TFWN. It's a simple, a simple acronym. And we really work with kids on this and, and, and helping them explore their own feelings and feelings of others. And this is a simple trick you can use without any of the rest of it, I think, right? It's when you have a, pro a problem, something happens like that, Travis knocks the ball out of your hand, whatever it happened to be, TFWN, first, think, what is that person thinking? How is that person feeling? What does a person want? What does this person need? So when you think about it, you, you put yourself in their shoes and you're trying to think about why are they doing this? Why are they thinking this way? It really helps us reduce our own anger at things. We can also use this for ourselves, right? You can think, I'm angry right now. What, what, why is that? And how does that person make me feel they get under my skin so bad? And, and why do they do that? Is there something I need to do differently to change that? I mean, you can look at this in both perspectives, but it's a great tip. The TFWN. And some teachers also uh, have kids provide examples of conflicts that they've experienced. And the teacher will kind of collect and summarize these uh, relevant conflicts on cards. And then kids uh, share the resolutions that work for them, or they can come up with some new ones. So you kind of have a, a conflict resolution box. Uh, I had this situation, and here's kind of how I solved it, and it fixed it, you know. And so it's a way for kids to learn different ways to solve problems without, you know, punching somebody in the face. And, and you kind of build a deck for that, and throughout the year, you reference them as you need them. And last, we talked about this before, sign your name. What's in a name, right? A name is, is man, I mean, when you think about it, you sign your name on a, a contract, uh, you get a loan for a new car, you have to sign your name. That says, man, you're responsible for that. You are going to be held for that. You know, your name is a big deal. You know, you get a baseball signature, man, those things can be valuable if it's the right player in the right moment, right? And so signatures are important and really training kids to say, hey, we're going to sign this. You sign this, you're committing. It's commitment. It's big. You sign your name on a dotted line for a new house or a new car or, you know, whatever. This is, this is you're accountable for it. So when you sign your name, it's important. 
but but that helps kids again get kids to give commitment uh to this uh, particular tool and try at least try to carry out what they've agreed to do between each other teachers who use this tool say that student ownership of agreements and resolutions is much better that there's more fairness uh there's more kindness right and patience with each other when stuff doesn't go right and, and this seems to carry over into things outside of the classroom and it leaves me more time for instruction because i'm not wrestling this stuff all the time the kids have to come up with a plan and talk about how they're going to solve the problem and so i don't have to be figuring out how am i going to fix it for them so that's some of the things that teachers say about that well goodness gracious i think that takes us to the bottom of the hour um, I'm, I'm just a couple of minutes past. Again, I want to thank you so much for uh, being here today. Uh, if any of this, if you had a question about it, you could use some extra support with it. Hey, I'm here to help. And it's a great opportunity for me to, to be a part of this. And I just want to help. And so you can email me at my email address. You can text or call me at that number. I'm happy to discuss uh, teaching and learning with you at any time I can be of service. I appreciate you. Uh, being here today, and I hope you found these useful. I'd uh, love to get feedback. Try them out in your class. Shoot me an email. Say, gosh, Rick, that really worked well, or or uh, I need to tweak it. Let me know. We appreciate you, Rick, being here with us today. Those were all some really great tools. That was a lot of good tools that we can use. Um, and so that's part of what we want to do with that new teacher cadre is really give teachers tools and strategies. So what you shared with us has are very helpful. We appreciate you all being here today, and I hope um, you took away something, and uh, good luck with the rest of your semester. I know some of us have been had a little uh, cold and dreary weather, so I hope uh, I hope our, we get some sunshine and, and everybody has a good rest of the week. So thank you for being with us.